So welcome, welcome everyone to the LSC, to this first, uh, at least for me, uh, in-person and online uh, public event. So for the very first time in a long time, I actually wearing shoes uh, for a public event, <laughs> not short, so it's quite an improvement. Um, so my name is Riccardo Crescenzi. I'm a professor of uh, economic geography uh, here uh, at the LSE. And I'm very pleased uh, uh, to be here uh, to welcome, I will then introduce them better, uh, but uh, Luis Dextra, Ian Begg, Dine uh, Kiriakopoulou, I hope I didn't mispronounce your name terribly, uh, and uh, Francesca, uh, Francesca Medda. So welcome to the LSE uh, for this uh, event that aims to discuss uh, uh, the key insights uh, from the report on economic, uh, social, and territorial cohesion. That is the flagship report uh, of the European Commission uh, on the evolution of economic and social disparities uh, within uh, and between subnational regions uh, in uh, the EU. Uh, the cohesion report offers, I have to say, an incredibly timely contribution to a debate that goes beyond uh, the European Union, a debate on the heterogeneous impact, among other things, on the pandemic, in an era in which new unpredictable shocks, like the war, for example, uh, are what we can now consider the new normal. So it's, it's a word of shocks. In terms of timing, the cohesion report has been launched almost at the same time as uh, uh, the, the UK uh, white paper on uh, leveling up that offers insights on similar issues from the UK standpoint, contributing uh, to a relevant collective reflection that, like I said, goes beyond uh, uh, the U European Union, the UK, a general uh, reflection that also involves uh, the United States, but also uh, many uh, emerging economies that at the moment are reflecting on uh, uh, regional development, recovery, and uh, the new challenges linked with the digital and green transitions. So it is incredibly timing and incredibly connected with wider, with wider debates. Reading the, the, the cohesion report, as I'm sure many of you uh, have done, it's 500 pages, uh, I, I think, but so I'm sure uh, most of uh, my students who are present here uh, have read it uh, back to back. Um, <laughs> reading the cohesion report, it is immediately like apparent that some challenges for EU regions are still there, reports after report. So that's the eighth report, and this shows maybe I'm getting older, but I mean, some of the key some of very important issues like are still there, probably since uh, the very first uh, uh, cohesion report. Um, infrastructural gaps, uh, unemployment uh, imbalances, different capabilities to react to shocks. Now what we are discussing and what we'll discuss today about the pandemic is not very different to so some of the discussions that we had with reference to the 2008-2009 uh, uh, crisis. Uh, a fundamental club convergence by which some regions tend to seem to be converging with other uh, similar regions. Uh, and, and this reminds me uh, of, of the lectures that uh, I had here with, uh, with, with Danny Kwa when I was a student and when we discussed about club convergence. So, that, that, however, that now seems to be affecting even the richest uh, regions in Europe. When you read the report, you discover that also even Lombardy, where Milan is based, is not doing that well. So uh, I think uh, this, is, this, this shifts the conversation really uh, about uh, what happens to the uh, really least developed regions in Europe to a wider conversation uh, on, on, all, uh, on all regions. So I think this is incredibly, incredibly helpful. Uh, but so there are all challenges, all debates, but there are also a number of new challenges that have emerged with the, with the pandemic. And now with the war, that might change the picture significantly, maybe, yes, no, that's something that we should discuss, and calling for new frameworks of understanding, maybe. So we need new concepts, new theories to understand the new, new, the new reality. But we also need new evidence to guide evidence-based decisions on what we need to do in practice in order to manage in order to deal with the digital and green transition, given that effective tools, tools that work on the ground, are needed now more than ever. So discussing evidence, for example, from the evaluation uh, of what cohesion policy has achieved or what it has not uh, achieved is clearly beyond the scope of the cohesion report that needs to offer a consistent and unbiased picture of the current state of the union in, digit, in, 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 in regional terms. However, Lewis, uh, as the, 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 the lead economist behind the, the, the cohesion report has really like embraced the task of bringing in the hard evidence that comes from independent peer-reviewed research very seriously. 
and has engaged in a real tour de force, I have to say, looking at his engagements uh, around Europe and online, has engaged in a real tour de force of academic events like this uh, to discuss uh, uh, the, the hard evidence, to discuss the evidence and insights that come from uh, different perspectives on what to do, what works. And this is really the objective of today's meeting, to see the cohesion report as a picture, as a stepping stone, as a way to initiate a debate in Europe and beyond to discuss what needs to be done in practice on the ground in the regions of the world in order to deal with the challenges associated with shocks like uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, like uh, uh, the war. And what are the tools that work, the tools that do not work when it comes to the digital and green transitions? This is what we'll be discussing today. So Luis will start with a presentation of uh, the, the, the cohesion report from this perspective, looking at uh, the impact of the crisis and the digital and green recovery in uh, the EU regions. And our discussions will follow offering different critical perspectives on what comes from the report with uh, uh, the idea of what works in mind. Discussing Ian uh, Begg, who is a professorial research fellow and co-director of the Darendorf Forum at the European Institute at the LSC, on, more on the institutional aspects and the evidence from cohesion policy. Danae Kiriakopoulou is a senior policy fellow at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment here at the LSC. And, and, and Danae will discuss more uh, the green transitions and, and the challenges associated with the, the green transition and, and, and the tools that work in all regions to support the, 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 the green transition. And Francesca Medda, who is a professor of applied economics and finance and director of uh, the Finance and Technology Institute at UCL, uh, will discuss uh, the issue of the digital transition, where we stand and what can be done to facilitate uh, transition, the digital transition in all regions. So for those on, on Twitter, in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is uh, LSC Europe. Uh, this online event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a video and postcard, podcast subject to no technical difficulties. Um, as usual, there will be the chance for you uh, to put your questions to our speakers uh, here in person and online. If you are joining us online, please submit your questions using the Q&A function. Uh, in uh, the uh, um, in your Zoom room, questions will be submitted uh, to uh, me, and I will pose as many as possible to the speakers trying to develop a coherent narrative. For those in the audience, please raise your hand and wait for my colleague to pass you the microphone. Please let us know your name and affiliation. We are particularly keen to receive questions from the many students uh, who are here, alumni and incoming students. So please uh, join the uh, conversation. That's everything for now. So I am delighted to hand this over to Luis uh, for his presentation. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Ricardo. I hope the microphone works. It seems like it does. Um, that's the one. Yes. Start it off. To try and keep some kind of discipline, I'll put a timer. So if it goes off, I know I'm jabbering on. I used to be a student here. I did a master's at LSE. I used to sit on these benches. Well, not this building because it wasn't ready yet. But um, it's a real pleasure for me here to come talk to you, tell you about what we've researched, but also to learn from you about what you think we should be doing more of uh, in the future. So let me quickly take you through some of the highlights. I know the report is rather long. Uh, Ricardo was very positive about the report, but I think he exaggerated the length. It's only like 330 pages, and most of the pages are filled with colorful maps. So, I mean, the text is considerably shorter. So looking at the pandemic, um, here we try uh, and show you in an animated way the excess mortality over the last two years. And it really shows the different waves in the different locations. And of course, the way people were trying to respond to those waves, right? You, you see a first wave, particularly in Northern Italy and Spain, but then later you see big waves in Romania and Bulgaria. That has to do with many things like including healthcare capacity, but also vaccine hesitancy. And initially it started out in what I would call Southern Europe. Uh, these are uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, Malta, and Cyprus. But then in the second and the third wave, it was much higher in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe are all the countries that joined in 2004 or later, minus Cyprus and Malta. 
So this is the overall impact. And you can clearly see, you know, you still see the big spike in, in Milan and uh, Madrid, but you can also see that many regions in Poland, uh, Czechia, Slovakia, and Bulgaria had very high levels of excess mortality. In response to this uh, pandemic, uh, there were lots of restrictions imposed on people's mobility, on the ability for people to cross borders. And of course, this had a massive impact on especially the tourism economy. On the map, you'll see the regions which are very vulnerable to tourism, uh, to shock to the tourism sector because they have a very high number of tourism nights and it's very volatile over the season. And so on the left, you can see which countries really were heavily affected by the reduction in the number of tourism nights per resident. And so Cyprus, Malta, Croatia, Greece, Spain were all heavily affected, as well as Austria. And this is one of those examples of an asymmetric shock. On the one hand, you have the health impact, then you've got the restrictions, and then you've got a significant reduction in the number of hours worked. So also new uh, issues like the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, shocks linked to technological change, or regions that are very dependent on a, a few narrow sectors may be vulnerable to, to asymmetric shocks in the future as well. Demographic change, topic that we come to time and time and again, because actually um, demography in Europe is changing. It's changing quite rapidly. We see big increases in the population over 65, but the working age population is shrinking. The young people, number of young people is shrinking. And again, it has a very clear spatial pattern, right? If you look at the map, you can see that Northwestern Europe overall, all the three types of regions are growing. You can see that in the column on the right. But then you see, for example, rural regions in southern uh, EU are shrinking, primarily because of natural po population change. And then you can see in eastern EU, both the rural and the intermediates are starting to shrink through a combination of natural change and net migration. So what do you do in response to these slow moving but big trends? You need to try and find different ways to recruit more people from groups with lower employment rates. That could be women, that could be young people, older workers, it could be migrants, and you need to invest more in technology um, or more about technology later, but innovation and really making sure that you can make the most out of the workers you have. In terms of not fewer people uh, of school age, you'll have to reduce the number of schools and you'll have to find creative ways to still provide specialized courses there. Public services and healthcare will need to serve a growing number of elderly people. And so as a result, we'll need to increase their capacity and also the locations there. Now coming to the green transition, uh, we really like to emphasize that it should be a just transition. And so we really have started to discuss what is going to be the territorial impact of that green transition. Um, all actors will have to make changes. All sectors will have to make changes. We'll have to reduce energy consumption boost renewable energy production. But from those goals, we don't know where the impacts are going to be highest, of course. The green transition is broader than just climate change. We also focus on, on biodiversity and health. And so we need to continue to reduce air pollution, still high in Eastern Europe, expand wastewater treatment, still high, uh, still insufficient in Southern and Eastern EU. Uh, protect our soils and promote biodiversity. So, and all these will have differentiated impacts, right? And so one of the things that we've discussed, uh, and this was very uh, discussed at length in the European Council, is can we replace short haul flights with rail? And on the map, what you see, you see all the rail connections uh, between cities of at least 200,000 inhabitants and that are less than 500 kilometers away. What can you see? There's, for me, two takeaways from the map. Very few fast connections in Eastern EU, and the fast connections are typically national, right? You can see in Italy, a lot of fast connections within the country. Spain, fast connections within the country. France, primarily within the country. Soon as you cross a border, everything slows down. Now, of course, you've got the Pyrenees, the Alps, a bit difficult for train to get across. But even if you look at all the connections, a national border reduces the frequency, reduces the speed. And so that makes it more difficult for these connections to compete with uh, short haul flights.
If you look at the two charts, you can see that uh, city pairs that aren't too far away, so less than 300 kilometers, typically the train actually offers as quick a connection, if not quicker, than uh, an airline connection. And what's that advantage based on? Primarily based on speed. If you have a fast rail connection, you can see on the bottom graph, then more of those city pairs are above that line. And above that line, it's faster to get there by train downtown from downtown. But thinking again about this transition, um, we also need to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from transport. And that really requires us to shift to other modes of transport or shift to electric uh, transport. And so it really is an important question, who can do that and where can you do that, right? Here we look at the distance to the closest service by the degree of urbanization. Here we use a, a six fold classification and in cities, most of these services are very close by. So you can walk there, you can cycle there, there's public transport available. But as soon as you get to the rural areas, distances increase, public transport becomes less frequent because populations dispersed and destinations are dispersed. And so there's a much smaller capacity there to shift to walking, to shift to uh, cycling or to public transport. So there to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we'll have to electrify that transport mode as quickly as possible. But the key question, of course, is can they afford to do so and to do so in time? Um, the demonstrations in France with the yellow vest also clearly highlighted that this is a politically sensitive and potentially explosive topic. So we also want to try and see what we can do in rural areas uh, to strengthen them. And one of the things we are looking at is the role of smaller cities, towns and villages. Um, the little chart I acknowledge may be a little hard to read, but basically you see all the services uh, next to each other. We organize the settlements by size. So you see what's it, six categories there, villages, towns, cities. And then in orange, you see what share of those settlements have a particular service. And then in blue, you see what share of those settlements have that service if they're the biggest settlement around. So if they're the biggest settlement in 45 minutes drive, then we, we count those separately and call them regional centers. And the smaller the settlement, the more it helps to be a regional center, the more likely you are to have a primary school or a pharmacy or a bank, a doctor, secondary school, cinema, et cetera. And so that indicates that these settlements serve more than just their local population, but they serve the wider region. And so how can we use that knowledge to really strengthen rural areas where we're seeing a lot of uh, population decline as well? So we've developed a long-term vision for rural areas to really create a framework to address the challenges. And also one of the things that we've noted is that if you look at uh, voting patterns, you also see that rural areas are less likely to trust the EU and more likely to vote for a party against EU integration. Looking at the fair transition, um, here you can see that in some regions, um, greenhouse gas emissions have increased, sometimes quite substantially since 1990. And our goal is to reduce those emissions by 55% by 2030. And the, the clock is ticking, so we really need to accelerate that uh, and reach also a, a carbon neutral economy by 2050. So how are we gonna do that? Um, it will generate benefits, obviously, of doing that, but it will also generate costs. And in particular, we are concerned whether less developed regions and rural uh, regions will this benefit more or less. Will it cost them more? Right now, we have a just transition mechanism that's very narrowly focused on a couple of regions, heavily dependent on sectors that emit a lot of carbon, but maybe we need to expand that to cover other issues, et cetera. Another question we're asking is, should we create new perspectives for peripheral regions or less developed regions? And here, I wanted to show an example of what's happening in remote regions. If you look at the two dotted lines, those are remote rural regions and remote intermediate regions. So they're far from the closest city. And economically, over the past two decades, they have diverged. They haven't been converging. Rural regions close to cities, however, have been converging quite steadily. So, the question here is how can we respond to this? How can we help remote regions and ensure that they have more economic growth and, and high quality of life? 
And the things that we're trying to consider on that front are, you know, what are their strategic resources like biodiversity, renewables, what kind of amenities do they have? And we need to also think about the distribution of needs and endowments. Moving on to the digital transition um, here, we only have some data at the national level. I always find that frustrating, but we're working to get regional data here, but we've organized the, uh, the, the countries by level of GDP, so less moderately and highly developed. And if you look at, say, whether they're using new digital technologies like cloud computing, big data, artificial intelligence, every single time you can see that firms in more developed regions and more developed member states are more advanced they're already doing that and the ones in less developed member states are doing that the least even things like e-commerce and e-business not particularly complicated again the firms in less developed member states are lagging so this is an area for concern also the speed of broadband particularly important when you're trying to follow a class online or this lecture online um, we've looked at the average speeds tested per municipality, and we saw that in most cities, you can really get a speed on average that's higher than 30 Mbps. But in rural areas, it's only roughly 80% lives in a rural area where you can get that speed. But when it comes to higher speeds, 100 Mbps, you can see a big contrast. Four out of six city residents have that speed. One in six rural residents has that speed. So you really see an urban-rural divide when it comes to speed. Another aspect, and the digital is a bit sprinkled across the report, uh, is that we've looked at e-government. For us, that's an important way of making public services more accessible, more efficient, more transparent. And so on the left, you can see the map where people are using uh, the internet to interact with public authorities. Pay your taxes, pay a fine, request a particular certificate, et cetera. And you can see in the Nordic regions and in the Netherlands, 80% of the individuals said, yes, I did that this year. Or, whereas if you look at Romania, Bulgaria, and also Southern Italy, you see quite a few places where less than 20% of the population has said that. And these are data for 2020. Going back seven years, you can see a slow growth, but there's still a lot of catching up to do. And then the last map shows how many people have used a computer or who've never used a computer in their life. And the dark red regions said, that's 30% of the people who said, never touch such a thing. I don't know how it works. I barely know what it looks like. So if you're trying to convince people to use online services and they don't know how to use a computer, of, of course, then you have an additional obstacle, right? So you need to help them and guide them uh, to make sure that they understand how to use these tools and get the connections they need to be able to use these services. This is a particularly worrying one. Um, this is uh, looking at innovation. Basically, the map shows the level of innovativeness of all the regions, and it goes from dark brown, uh, very low levels of innovation to kind of green, and then blue, the highest level of innovation. Now, if you look at the changes over time, you can see that less developed regions have become more and more concentrated in the least innovative category. Also transition regions, you know, GDP between 75 and 100%, more and more concentrated in the two bottom categories. Whereas the more developed regions are becoming more advanced innovation. They're more concentrated in the top two categories. So this is a worrying uh, trend for us because we expect innovation to be important for all regions and allow them to catch up. And here we're seeing an, an opening of a divide that could reduce long-term convergence. We also are concerned about the left behind places. There are many different definitions of the left behind places. Here, I'm showing the development trapped regions. This was based on research done here at LSE uh, by Andres and Simona and Michael Storper. And we looked at whether regions were growing more slowly in terms of GDP per capita, GDP over employment and employment over population. And we compared a region to itself in the past, to the national level and to the EU level. And so the darker regions are the ones that have been trapped for the most, uh, the longest period over that, between 15 uh, to 19 of the 19 years that we've observed. So there are a couple of things you can see from this map. It's a complicated one, so let me talk you through it. The regions in pink have a very low level of GDP per capita in 2000, so below 75%. There are very few dark red ones. So the least developed regions tend not to be trapped that frequently. Uh, 
The next category is between 75% and 100% back in 2000. And there you can see more dark brown regions. So among the three categories, the, those transition regions are the most likely to be uh, uh, in uh, a trap for a long period of time. And then you have the regions with an above average GDP in 2000, but also there you see quite a few dark green regions. So not, you know, being highly developed doesn't protect you from being in a development trap. Looking at those regions that were at least trapped for 15 years out of the 19, they had a number of common characteristics. Less educated labor force, lower investments in R&D, lower quality of institutions, and a weaker manufacturing set or, uh, sector. So these are the characteristics. Now the question is, how do we help regions escape from those uh, traps? This is the last bit of my presentation. I'll focus a little bit on policies. Um, this has been one of the heavily commented upon uh, charts in the cohesion report. Let me explain it relatively simply. We've looked at our funding and compared it to total national public investment. And we saw when we compared it for two programming periods, 2007-13, 2014-2020. Um, what we realized is that for cohesion countries, the, that relationship has completely changed. We used to be the equivalent of about a third of public investment in 2014, 2020, it was more than half. So really, you can read that in two ways. It means that public investment collapsed and we compensated for that collapse, trying to maintain high public investments despite the economic crisis in 2008, despite the fiscal consolidation that followed. But of course, in the absence of public investment, in, a, in the context of a reduced uh, national investments, cohesion policy obviously also is going to have a reduced impact on growth. So it's very double, but it's clearly showing a, a very stark trend there. We've looked at cohesion policy, trying to uh, simulate or model the impact of funding uh, that we provide and the type of projects that we support. We do this with a general equilibrium model, regional model called Romolo. And so we show the allocations per capita as a shared GDP on the left. Then we show the, the, the short-term impact just after the expenditure has ended 2023. And then we show the long-term impact. Now, the impact of cohesion policy is in part direct from the expenditure, but it's also structural when we invest in innovation or transport or things that continue to benefit the economy after the expenditure has stopped. And so there is a structurally positive effect. And because there are trade links between less developed and more developed regions, also the more developed regions benefit from those investments. And in the medium term, all regions are modeled to have a positive impact uh, over, over that, from, that uh, from those investments. I've looked at a couple of other um, policies, EU policies as well. I've looked at the common agricultural policy and to my great pleasure, I discovered that actually uh, less developed regions receive more funding from the Rural Development Fund and also more funding from the common agricultural policy in general. I wasn't sure that this was going to be the case, so this was also for us a, a pleasant surprise. And you can see consistently that, you know, on the, the charts on the, on the, on the, my right, your right, um, the blue dot is the, the, the less developed regions and it tends to be the highest one uh, for all the countries. We've looked at Horizon 2020 and this promotes excellence wherever it happens, right? So it's explicitly saying we want to fund excellent research and we don't care in what member state or what region it occurs. But if you look at the trend, you can see that Eastern regions don't score very well. You know, they don't manage to attract a lot of funding there from, and rural regions don't do either, right? Typically capitals, larger cities perform very well when it comes to Horizon 2020 funding and the rest do far less well. Last period budget was 80, million, 80 billion. Horizon Europe will have a, bit, a budget of 95 million billion. And so we've added and expanded this widening participation and spreading excellence activity. We'll triple the amount of funding going to that to really help less developed member states and regions to develop their research and innovation capacity. The Connecting Europe facility invests in transport and really a 
primarily invest, well, they invest much more heavily in cohesion countries. You know, funding is three times higher compared to non-cohesion countries. So clearly they should be uh, helping us to close that infrastructure gap and help the less developed member states. Um, you can see a little bit what they're focused on and it's primarily rail, which of course has a, the benefit of being a, a one of the lower carbon modes. We'll increase the budget for the Connecting Europe facility from 23 billion to 34 billion uh, in this period, but it will also cover digital and energy uh, infrastructure. This is not in the cohesion report. I was asked to add this uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's called the Recovery and Resilience Fund or RRF. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It's a very different animal. Um, it has a lot of funding available either through loans, about 380 billion, or through grants, about 340 billion, so big funding. It has to be spent on climate and digital transition. You can see those concentration requirements there. And it has to be spent very, very fast. You have to spend it by the end of 2026. And for such large funding blocks, that is going to be challenging. It was also designed to be temporary. We'll find out if it will remain so. There's zero regional targeting in there. It's not required, so it's member state specific. And payments aren't based on, say, certified expenditure, but purely of whether you've achieved to digitalize a particular service or not. Cohesion policy also has uh, con thematic concentration requirements. We've got 39, uh, 390 billion available, but we have much more time to implement it. There's a typo there. It should be by the end of 2029. So, you know, a significant uh, longer time period. And it's a structural policy, which is regionally targeted. So it's quite different in terms of approach. So, Conclusions, and I've got 15 seconds left. Yes. <laughs> um, COVID has definitely affected less developed regions most, and they had a significantly higher excess mortality, 17% compared to only 12% in more developed regions. So really, they have suffered from a health point of view far more. Um, green and also the tourism dependent regions are the ones that have been affected most by the restrictions uh, in response to the pandemic. And so the RRF is really intended to help us bounce back from that big uh, crisis because that was the biggest recession we've had since the war, since the Second World War. Um, and that's targeted on those countries that have really had a big impact. Um, green transition requires large investments by all actors and sectors, but it may be more challenging for less developed regions. So we're concerned about the risk of an asymmetric impact there. We want to accelerate the digital transition. And then the last thing, public policy should consider their impact on different regions. And that's what we call the, the principle of do no harm to cohesion. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Luisa, uh, for this very insightful presentation. I leave the floor uh, immediately to Ian uh, for his 10 minute discussion. Ian, the floor is yours. I'm not sure. No, sorry. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me to this. Lewis will already be expecting me to be critical because that's my role. And he and I have been through the iterations of cohesion reports at least three times up, up to now. And I, I realized with uh, some dismay that I've been writing about this since the 1980s, which is very disconcerting. <laughs> so let, let me go straight into some observations about it. You won't be surprised to hear, particularly in the last chapter, that there is a, broadly speaking, positive effect from cohesion policy on the objectives of the European Union. I think, though, that we have to at least be cautious about this, because one different interpretation of Lewis's chart on public investment is, yes, cohesion policy is dominating public investment in cohesion countries. But there is also supposed to be in the regulations a principle called additionality, which says it should add to rather than substitute for what's done within the member state. And this poses the question of whether instead of what member states are doing, they're taking what they would otherwise have spent in public investment and using it for current public spending. 
which is contrary to the objectives of cohesion policy. So there's the first potential challenge to you. There is evidence, yes, of convergence in some areas, but there are also areas, and sad to say, one of them is the south of Italy, where it continues to lag behind. It continues not to converge. And given it's an area that's had so much effort put into it over decades, we have to ask the question whether there's something abyss with the economic model, economic development model. Where I think you find that the, the cohesion report is extremely useful is that it enables us to say, what are the problems today? What are the things that are coming? Because that then enables the policy makers to try to decide what they should be doing about it to anticipate the next generation of problems rather than being reactive. I wonder though, whether in subsequent cohesion reports, there might be some sort of attempt to use just a little bit of scenario planning or foresight to try to go beyond the huge number of numbers that dominate cohesion reports over the years. I know it's a very attractive from the point of view of the authors, but sometimes you need to go a bit beyond that and say, is there something we're missing in documenting the way we do? Certainly, connecting next generation EU as a, as is not in the cohesion report, but as Lewis added in his penultimate slide, is an important matter, if only because the amount of money in next generation EU over the period up to 2026 is approximately 70% of the entire EU budget for the corresponding period. Now, that's a huge addition to the EU contribution to things that are going on inside the Union. And yet, it seems to be on a parallel track. There's a limited amount goes through the cohesion policy envelopes, but much of it is done separately, as, as was explained, going to the member state with different auditing procedures and so on. And that could potentially create tensions. It raises a further question, given that it has a, a net cross-border impact with countries like Italy, Spain, and many of the countries of Central and Eastern Europe being net beneficiaries, what happens when you take that away, which could happen as soon as 2026? Take it away and then suddenly you're switching off the tap for all these things that you want to achieve. And that could be alarming. No one to be left behind in the digital, tra digital transformation. It's one of these very glowing sounding uh, slogans that we hear so much about. But what are we going to do if some are left behind, be it at the level of households, of regions, or of uh, sectors which fail to, to engage in the digital transformation. Now, I know this is going to be dealt with far more by Francesca, so I won't want to elaborate on it, but uh, something also to highlight. Some of the consequences, nevertheless. 10 years ago, and you can tell me, Lewis, whether it's still used as an expression, cohesion policy agonized over what was called the logic of intervention, which is a long-winded way of saying, why are we doing it? And the logic of intervention intervention has this tension between economic development, which corresponds to the treaty objective of uh, diminishing disparities between regions, and these top-down, very all-embracing programs, such as uh, Ursula von der Leyen's Green Deal, the digital transformation, great, but that's an EU-wide policy, and economic development is something different from this. This is not the first time I've made this point to Lewis, so I'm sure he's already planned the answer, so he needs to, to answer. Innovation and research and development, they tend to be connected to digital in our, in our way of thinking, because we think innovation is research and development and all these sorts of things. But one significant chart, which has been very persistent over the years, is the huge concentration of research and development activity in a handful of EU regions, in great deserts of research and development in many areas, particularly to the east. But it's not just the east. You look at the south of Italy, the south of Spain, you also find these R&D deserts. And the reason this matters is that R&D is very much seen as the source of future productivity growth. It's not the only element in productivity growth, but it's a crucial one. If you, if you don't develop, you're not creating the products of tomorrow, maybe the services of tomorrow, more, more importantly than industrial products. When we talk about environmental, green, etc., 
there is a question to pose about whether another dimension of sustainable development, which is the social dimension, is given sufficient attention. It's in there in the treaty because it, this the heading of today was economic and territorial cohesion, but in the treaty it's economic, social, and territorial cohesion. And the social dimension is still a very significant part of cohesion spending. It tends to be spread across the EU, not nearly as rigidly targeted as the original development fund. One aspect of this that we need to consider is whether rising energy prices, which tend to be the cost of a transition from a carbon-based to a green fuel supply, are going to lead to some forms of fuel poverty, which creates new social problems. That too is something to consider. And for many regions, there are some dilemmas to consider. The first of those, we'll go to many about this, is regions, and sometimes I learn this, especially from my sometime friends at the committee of the regions, are the source of delivery. They're the, they're the people asked to get in the trenches and do the things these grand strategies are supposed to deliver. And yet, are they involved? Are regions effectively given a voice in these grand strategies? Well, I think you, know, you can guess from the way I'm articulating this question that I suspect not to the degree that we'd want to see. People are in places, and it's places that respond to what we're, we're trying to change. Now here I'm showing you a rather complicated chart devised for other purposes to try to unravel the effects of uh, the pandemic. We've lived through the first bit of this. This is the economic effects I'm considering here. The short-term economic impacts were very sharp contraction of GDP everywhere. For once, not a recession caused by the financial sector or something else, but by deliberate policy action. Governments chose to close down their economies to deal with the pandemic. Hence, you get the, the, the fall in macroeconomic sharp fall, and that in turn, because there's been a very strong Keynesian style response, has led to much higher public debt, debt and the potential risk of financial instability. But then you also note that there are going to be some losses of, of income, some job losses, and that in turn can lead to a rise in poverty. That rise in poverty has been associated in the past when you have such a downturn with what's called in the labor market, you know, it's hysteresis, the people who, who are detached from the labor market as a result of being in this position. But it's in the middle, I think, we need to consider some of the bigger effects. The uneven sector and local incidents, some of which uh, Lewis has documented, this may lead both to an uneven uh, picture of a uh, business failure, but also to an uneven resilience in responding or coming back from the crisis. So what this tells me is the two long-term legacies here. Significantly increased macroprudential tensions, much more fragility in macroeconomic terms, and a scarring effect that's likely to be enduring. So these are things to consider when I come around to talking about what we might face in future by way of demands on cohesion policy. First is implicit in what I've just been saying, you need to, need to look beyond the medium term effects of the pandemic. Consider whether some sectors, Lewis mentioned tourism, but there's also the likes of transport, leisure. Maybe if cities don't recover because people continue to work at home at least for a proportion of their time, many of the city centre personal services will, will lose demand. And if that happens, we'd like to see some sort of uh, rebalancing you know. And then it's a more awkward question, which is where I think foresight might, might well come in, but are there sectors we expect to gain from this? Well, we know there's like to be digital. We know health spending is going up everywhere. But are there other nuggets in the background there that we want to try to identify? And then is it, there is a question in all this, whether it leads to a new form of regional evolution a new spatial dynamic is the expression I've used there. We don't know what it is, but I think a very big, uh, big and important research question is if there is to be such a change in the economic configuration of the European Union, what, where, when? What, where, when are key policy questions. And if we don't have answers to them, we're going to miss out on the anticipation which I referred to earlier. Demographic change is another. Yes, we know 
that there are areas where the old are becoming a higher proportion of the workforce, where there's a, a dearth of younger people. So there's a very significant other driver of all of this, which is that mobile workers are leaving the areas which are aging most rapidly. And they tend to coincide with some of the less well-off parts of the European Union. You saw the diaspora of Greeks. So you've seen a more recent diaspora of Italians and Spaniards. They are coming to areas where they think there's more opportunity. And when that happens, you risk getting a new and bad equilibrium in countries which are exporting the labor. Things are stable, but they're stable at a lower level than you want. And that is potentially disturbing. Then price increases, cost of living increase. There's an expression which I found the origin of that dates back to a, a shadow chancellor in the British economy of 1965, a certain Ian MacLeod, who invented the words stagflation, a combination of stagnation and inflation. In those days, that was a, a growth rate falling to about 2%. We're nowhere near 2% these days. Inflation, we see shooting up to levels of 6, 7, 8%, and uh, the economy is stagnating, particularly real incomes falling. So is this going to happen? And what does it mean, for instance, for the co-financing model on which this cohesion policy relies? And my last point, inevitably, what happens as a result of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Without further ado, I'll leave the floor immediately to Dana for her, her comments. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I will focus my remarks on the challenges and opportunities for the green transition. Uh, and I'll talk about first about the why, why we face an urgency for this transition, the what, the need for the investment push and the finance, and then also the how quickly we can do this and what barriers we're facing and link to the social side as well that um, Ian and Lewis also raised. So we're living in an age of two crises, uh, the pandemic crisis and also the climate crisis, distinct but related. Um, and they both provide very strong incentives for acting for sustainable recovery and growth. We have the imperative to build back better after the pandemic. Um, and we also have the climate crisis that is very urgent. And there is an urgent need for a transition to a net zero economy. We also now have an energy crisis. Um, and seemingly, there are competing priorities between that and the green agenda. Uh, we're hearing that we have to pull back on investing in a sustainable recovery because we are pressured on the energy front because we're facing higher bills. Um, this couldn't be further from the truth. Um, the energy crisis has intensified the urgency to move away from fossil fuels and also to prioritize energy security and become more independent in terms of the energy sources. It's also a reason to act more strongly on climate and the green transition because uh, climate is something where policymakers can unite, especially in regions where you have many countries coming together, like in the EU. Um, and it's, it's a subject where at times of very uh, uh, broad geopolitical tensions, you can have agreement. So there is a very urgent need. And when you look at the science of how um, these impacts are being felt in, in the past, it used to be that you saw a high frequency of natural disasters in uh, developing economies. Now at the very heart of Europe, we've seen a lot of disasters in the past year. Um, just a few weeks ago, we were talking about it before, had a snowstorm in Greece, a lot of um, um, damages. We saw fires in Southern Europe over the summer. We saw floods in Western Europe. Uh, last year as well. So it's something that is now affecting all regions, but it's also affecting them very differently. And that's something that we saw with the pandemic as well, the different regional impacts um, of this crisis. And with the pandemic, it was your typical exogenous shock, uh, textbook exogenous shock that you see of um, coincidentally attacking the countries that had the least resources to address it. First, it was um, hitting countries with very weak uh, public uh, finances in Italy, for example, in Spain, that as Lewis showed us in the first map. And with the climate crisis, you're also seeing to an extent the same that countries that are more um, 
vulnerable to these physical risks of the climate crisis also have a very weak public finances in terms of preventing them and addressing them and, and um, generating these transitions. So that creates the need for more funding and financing and investment to close those gaps. We also need to remember that we need to channel investment in both mitigating those uh, causes of climate change. So the kind of policies that were suggested in terms of shifting from short haul flights to uh, more rail transport. This is definitely important in terms of shifting our energy mix, uh, in terms of tracking what are the, um, the emissions from fossil fuels in different regions and how that is changing. And we need to do that very urgently. But we also need to um, realize and understand and take into account in our policies that Climate change is inevitable already, and even in the in the best case scenario of achieving 1.5 degrees, uh, which is a commitment made in the Paris Agreement, we still will have very, very significant shifts in, in climate and in the weather effects that we're experiencing. Uh, we're already at over 1%. If we get to uh, 1.5, that will still be temperatures that the world will not have seen for a very, very long time. Um, and if we get to 2% or even 3%, which is uh, hopefully not a possibility anymore, um, that is temperatures that the earth will not have seen for millions of years. So it's, it's very, very different, it's very important, and we need to invest um, in the regions that will be affected the most by this. Um, we need to invest in adaptation, um, and that involves, um, for example, early warning system for natural disasters, uh, fires, floods, etc. It involves uh, making the buildings more res resilient and resistant, to higher temperatures, and it's directly linked also to productivity and, and social factors as well. So we must not, um, in looking at the balance of investment and finance, this has to be regional, but it also has to be between the different kinds of investments that we need to address the climate crisis, uh, adaptation and mitigation. We're also seeing in the EU at the moment a lot of um, efforts and, and progress in terms of um, upgrading the regulatory framework to incentivize these kinds of investments. And this agenda also needs to be aligned with the agenda of, of uh, investments and the cohesion policy as well. Um, so we're seeing, for example, the efforts to develop a, a green taxonomy. We're seeing efforts to upgrade the regulatory framework to look at how much risk banks are holding so that they do not invest in projects, uh, in companies, in regions that are more uh, vulnerable to climate risks. But if you, if you have that approach, then you may cut financing from regions and, and uh, companies and countries that need it the most, because if there is a higher risk of um, disasters or, or extreme weather events or loss of revenue, because suddenly there is not going to be tourism in a region that, has, uh, that depends on skiing tourism, for example, uh, then you, you cut that funding from the countries at the time that they need it the most. When a disaster hits, um, that's the time when they need the funding the most. So how do you support that at the same time as continuing the agenda of having very um, progressive regulations that direct the investments and the capital to those priorities of addressing these risks? Uh, I also want to talk about the links between the green and the social, and that was touched upon already uh, a little bit. But it's very important because we get very excited about all the radical reforms that we have to make in the economy, make it green overnight, but it will only succeed if, if it's accepted. It will only succeed if it is, and if it is perceived to be fair, just, and inclusive. Um, and this is very important because we're already starting to see some pushback against the green agenda. Uh, we're starting to hear voices saying that it's a cost, that it's too expensive, that uh, we have other things to focus on, and we saw that to an extent in Europe, we saw it in France, um, Louis already mentioned the yellow vests uh, example, where there was pushback to policies to increase fuel prices and fuel taxes. And eventually um, there was a kind of stepping back in that policy. We're seeing it in the UK also now uh, with calls even for a net zero referendum with uh, groups of members of parliament trying to have scrutiny of the government's net zero plans. And um, we cannot afford to have political um, support for another four years of a, a US president who holds us back and removes 
um, the, the biggest economy in the world from the Paris Agreement. We cannot afford to have those kind of policies taking hold for uh, an electoral cycle in Europe or elsewhere. And this will be something that will hold us back. So we have to balance the kind of need to, to move further and faster very, very um, strongly with the need, the need to have an accepted set of policies. So how to do this? We need to shift the narrative to a positive story of what is necessary investment spending, that this is comparing it to what it would be without it. So presenting the facts and data like we saw today in terms of what would the impact on the economy be on, on regional inequalities if we do not move as fast, it would be even worse. So this is not a cost, it's an investment. Um, and the counterfactual is much worse and much more costly. And as you um, waste more time and, and uh, wait for it to happen later, the cost rises and it even becomes in some cases impossible when you lose uh, biodiversity, for example, when you uh, cross certain tipping points and thresholds, it becomes very difficult. Um, and we must also learn lessons from uh, globalization, I would say, where we also had um, a development where the net benefit was uh, positive, it was a benefit, but the, 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 the benefits were not evenly shared across regions. And then you saw this kind of pushback of uh, my country first kind of policies that we need to reverse globalization, uh, we need to um, exit projects like the European Union, um, and being more skeptical towards acting together uh, against uh, global challenges. So uh, let's avoid that trap and focus on, yes, we know that it will be a net benefit. We know that acting on, on climate is something that is going to um, make our economy more prosperous, more fruitful, but we need to pay a lot of attention on, on making sure that everyone wins out of that. And, and we heard in the previous presentations how uh, we may have unintended consequences, negative side effects, fuel poverty, people losing their jobs because certain sectors become obsolete. So a lot of the investments also need to focus on how do we um, support those. And similarly to the point that was made about the digital transformation, what do you do with those that are left behind? We also need to think about that in the case of those who are left behind because of the green transition. And one strategy to do that is also to emphasize the co-benefits of climate action. Um, if the public considers the green transition a cost as something that is an elite project, then what may be issues that they do care about that are positive co-benefits of climate action that help us prioritize which policies will have the greatest public support? Is it air pollution and health in certain regions? Uh, it may be fuel poverty and energy efficiency in others. It may be questions of housing affordability, it may be questions of um, removing energy dependence uh, from imports. So looking at how the distributions of these co-benefits, whether they're economic, social, health, uh, resilient, uh, are distributed can also help us guide our, our policy options. So I'll end there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you very much for these um, incredibly helpful um, comments. And Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, everyone. So, okay. So uh, now the last part is on digital. As you know, um, I work at UCL, and usually I, I work on digital investment. So it was a very interesting. For me to say, okay, I have to read this incredible 500 words. And there were 500 pages in reality, <laughs> because you have to read all the, the, the map and the graph. So, okay. Um, so, my first attempt was okay, there is a war, there has been a pandemic, all these things is all old. We have to rewrite completely everything. So, I could, I said, okay, I go there and say, Throw it in the trash, uh, restart from, from zero, because when we will finish this war, Europe will be a little bit different, a little bit uh, in a major way. So there is this part that we have to consider. But OK, I read it. And I read it, I took the index, and it was uh, one chapter, which is written, Smart Europe. And therefore, as all, all of us knows, 
uh, smart is related with digital. I don't know, we invented. So now here we are stupid, the people that are online smart. <laughs> so, okay, I say, okay, I should have read, I should read only one chapter, Smart Europe. And unfortunately, in Smart Europe, there is nothing about digital. And this was very surprising. And I said, okay, so this means that I have to read everything. So I read everything with the eyes of a digital transition. So I will give you the criticism as a digital transition should be written and everywhere there. So first of all, there is a confusion sometimes when we put together green transition and digital transition. And I explain a bit uh, faster and let's see if we agree. I come from, uh, so this, my institute is uh, housed in the engineering faculty. In engineer, the engineers have this motto, we make things work. So we don't make things better, beautiful, nice, we make things work. So that is our motto. So let's take uh, this motto of the engineer and transform for the digit, for the green transition. In the green transition, we make things work for a better world. So we have an idea of what the world should be better, and we make things to, to a better world, okay? So we have a, a moral and ethical decision of what is better on a sustainable way. So I'll give you, an, I'll give you a, a, a two examples. Is a better world to have a nuclear power station, like we have now in the green transition, is a green, is a sustainable investment, invest in weapon like we have in ESG funds at this moment. So these are moral decisions that we have to take, but these are the green transition. In the digital transition, on the other hand, we just make work better. We make things work better. This is our uh, objective. In fact, the European Union look at the, the technology in a neutral way. It's agnostic sometimes. So for example, when we look at blockchain, uh, they say, okay, any site, any firms can use any type of DLT. So blockchain is not specific. You can use Ethereum, you can use uh, another system. The European Union does not make, uh, makes uh, completely freedom with this. So that, uh, I think it's a distinction that we have to make when we talk about a digital transition and green transition. So let's look at a digital transition. So I go uh, step by step. So when I look at digital transition, I have to see three elements for me, access, transparency, and democracy. These three elements have to be present when we see a transition in digital. And I will see these three elements if we can see it uh, through this document. So let's go first uh, to access. So access is, I'm um, looking at the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 10, 10 minutes, okay. <laughs> 12, I said 12, I will be 12. <laughs> okay, so okay, access. First things, access, uh, synonymous also connectivity. Of course, uh, we have a chapter dedicated to transport. Uh, not a, there is a, just a small part uh, talking about the connection, connectivity, broadband connection, which is re related to the um, to connector of the internet, uh, which is not a very good indicator, if I have to say. Uh, the situation of the EU, if I look at just the internet connection, is very bad. The target are not being reached, only the Netherlands and uh, and Denmark have reached the, the target. The rest of Europe, which the target was fixed in 2020, did not reach. Uh, the rest of the chapter of connection speak about transport. I'm sorry, I'm very disappointed. But uh, if we talk about uh, firms, 46% of enterprise have a broadband of 100 MBS, and, but still very low. Uh, development member lowers. So when we talk about industry 4.0, we are not there. So, okay, let's go to the next step. So we talk about, so accessibility and connection, not very good. Let's look at uh, transparency. What do, I, what do I look for when I look for transparency? So transparency for me in digital means intelligibility. So I have to understand as a citizen, 
provision, service, uh, procedure. So I have to have access and also have a transparent access. So for example, have uh, knowledge, perfect knowledge of where are my data, how they are used, how is the information of the government and so on. So this is transparency, which in digital, in digital transition should be achieved. So I look through the chapter, chapter five, including Europe should be there where I, I found the transparency. And also there, there is no much. There is something about a citizen have to have skills and personal engage in society, not very much. Chapter five, terrible. Um, <laughs> so, and then I stopped because there was nothing about democracy, the uh, transparency. So I look at the third element. So accessibility, I said, uh, transparency, democracy. What do I mean about democracy? In digital democracy, we mean that we are uh, reducing intermediary. So one of the elements of digitalization is uh, this intermediation. This intermediation means uh, I reduce cost, I reduce the time, I reduce a lot of things. And for example, one is finance. Uh, democracy, however, in uh, digital also embrace something, a concept that all of you know. So it's the concept of the capability approach uh, by Sen, which was invented in 1980. So you have to give to the citizen the freedom to find, uh, to choose a different uh, functionality in the combination that he needs to become a real citizen. So this is an element of uh, democracy, when we talk about democracy in digital, that is must be present. So I'll look at chapter six, Europe closer to citizen, very bad. <laughs> and it's so bad that they question uh, people around that they say, do you use a computer? And uh, the results are terrible. <laughs> now, look at you. You don't use a computer. You should have asked, do you have a portable phone? Do you use an app? This is what uh, I, I want to say, the final results here. Chapter seven, better governance, worse than before. <laughs> because we see that 20% of Southern Italy and Romania use internet to interact with public authority. And I say, oh my God, in Italy we have uh, digital identity. Why, why did you calculate this 20%? We all use it. And, um, and only 80% in Estonia and in the Netherlands. So, okay, overall, the, my, my marks is low. Uh, but uh, I go to chapter eight, so the last part. So you invest quite a lot, a lot of money on the inclusion, but a lot of money also on the smart Europe, which I assume is about digital. And what, so one of the things that I see is the lack of, uh, that already uh, been mentioned, the lack of uh, interdependency between policy, across policy. So one policy has to be linked with another. And the green, you can obtain a better green if you have the digital, of course. So these are things logical. So, and it has to be a really a multiplier effect. If I use two policies together, it should be an effect, notice there. So still very silos, very old fashioned. Now, uh, let's look at the reality. Uh, I think Europe is much better than what you describe. Um, much, much better. I think uh, the uh, COVID-19 and as well as the war has all the cries that give us an opportunity. And uh, an opportunity that is concealed, but is there. And there is the prospect, really, if we are more ambitious and we go beyond, really, the, the measure that we have. So my thing is, is true. I will throw it almost on this document because I will want to an, Euro an European document that more ambitious. We have uh, these two prizes we have to look it up differently. And uh, so we have the possibility to uh, do a large scale reimagination of the economic structure. The crisis has and is accelerating a lot of trends, the trends on the, on the environment, the trends of the government, but the digital really, the digitalization is helping a lot. 
market consolidation, regional cooperation. They are creating new opportunities. They are all there. And it's important for me, and this is the error that has been made, to avoid this narrow approach that has been taken. So, for example, assessing the digital only through uh, the measurement of the internet or measure of uh, uh, how many research and development. So, in the digital world, as you know, everything is open, uh, open, uh, open source. I don't need to do a patent. Blockchain is there. I just do an, an application. Application doesn't need a patent at all. And I share everything. So it's like uh, this world has been looked with the eyes, uh, they don't see the reality, the, the real Europe that is there. So I see a more positive Europe than what you see. So I think uh, uh, the digital divide is uh, really, can, you can see it, uh, but uh, you have to see also, you have to catch the correct uh, elements that are there. So uh, not only, uh, the measurement of the of the internet that like you have to look infrastructure application service and uh, social connectivity versatile of working uh, among the other things and i would have liked to see really the two aspects uh, a bottom up approach where the digital transformation engine is at the level of company and community and we see a lot of application particularly in the crisis and also the top-down approach where you see the intervention of the public authority uh, and European Union above all in creating this environment where uh, the ecosystem of innovation works. So, so these are, uh, should have been my, my point. Uh, last thing that I want to say is that uh, since I'm coming from one of the regions that you said that we are really beyond, I think we have the opportunity to leapfrog Thanks to the digitalization, thanks to the digitalization, the marginal leader can become at the center. We have experience. The crisis has accelerated everything. What we have written for a long time, we have seen in reality. It's possible to speak with my the students in another part of the world. And it's nothing so bad that we have done a hybrid, we can do meeting, we can do a lot of things. So I think it, here is a really an opportunity. And I say it's like a, a, a self. Now, either you catch this wave or you, you miss it. So this is, a, is, a, is an opportunity, these two crises allow us to really see the wave and then go. you have to go on top of the wave. Because if not, the wave will smash and we will be under, <laughs> underneath, the, underneath the wave. Okay, so I say uh, both is not bad. I think there are opportunity, there are possibility to improve. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, I think Luis has a lot of material for the next report, the ninth. Uh, <laughs> so we look forward uh, to reading it uh, and, and see the evidence base. Um, so uh, we have like many questions also coming uh, uh, from the online audience. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to collect like a few more questions also from uh, uh, people here in the room uh, and then uh, give uh, Luis the, 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 the chance uh, for um, some comments. Uh, and then maybe also some shorter comments from uh, from our discussions. Um, anyone from the audience here? Davide, over there. Hello, I'm Davide. I'm a fellow in economic geography here at LSE. I have a question about the digital transition for Lewis. Uh, so there is this recent uh, empirical literature which emphasizes a lot the importance of uh, firms in explaining and understanding the digital gap. And especially when we think uh, that there is a, a few uh, bunch of firms which are mostly productive, large and better managed that are able really to reap the effects of digital investments and adopt digital te technologies in first place. So and obviously this become quite uh, fundamental when we think about how we're gonna spend all this money that we have right now, uh, thanks to the next generation of you. Uh, so I would like you to briefly comment on how you, you plan or whether uh, to tackle this uh, firm heterogeneity, this firm dimension in, uh, in the cohesion report. 
uh, comments, questions from the audience here in the room. Please. Hi, um, thank you very much for, for the presentation. Um, I am an LED student and uh, my question is related to what you presented um, about um, seeking to replace short flights uh, by rail. And you, taught, uh, you talked about the speed dimension. Um, one dimension that is like often not covered when, uh, when discussing this issue is the price dimension, I feel. So my question is, um, how do you want to, um, like, what are you going to do to, to reduce the cost uh, of traveling by, by high-speed rail as, as compared to, uh, like, short-distance flights that are much steeper, much, much cheaper today still? Thank you. Are there questions for now? Anyone else from the room? Um, we have uh, uh, two questions coming from um, our online audience. Uh, one comes from Giulia Pesaro from um, the Politecnico di Milano, who was asking a question very close to um, what Francesca highlighted. Um, how, I mean, in the report, we see a lot of e emphasis on computers, but it's, 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 it's clear uh, that most of the interaction, including with the public administration, happens through uh, smartphones uh, and, and the proficiency in using smartphones. So we wonder, like, uh, how uh, the, uh, this has been taken into account and, and, and uh, what is the evolution of your thinking in this regard. Um, then we have another question from uh, Miguel Vidal uh, Bover from the OECD, who asked, and I think it's a question for Luis, but also for our panelists in terms of like where should authority and resources be allocated when it comes to the digital and green transitions? Like what is the optimal like institutional design in terms of responsibilities? It's national, it is local. I mean, the literature has highlighted like problems when resources in terms of dealing with policies as complex as digital and green are like the vault regions or cities. Uh, uh, so that, that's to be interesting to know like your perspective on this. And um, uh, I think it's also important to remember what you mentioned in your slides, uh, Luis, is that the recovery fund has no uh, regional targeting, but then it's up to the member states, but member states do have a regional targeting built into the, in Italy, for example, it's 40% of total resources allocated to less developed regions. So there is definitely, so if you compare this with GDP, you do see that lots of funds from uh, the, the recovery fund are gonna go to this region. So we really need to think about like how the tools uh, uh, interact. Um, there is also a final question um, about the research undertaken in measuring displacement of regional policy interventions and what mitigations can be introduced to minimize displacement from uh, uh, Margaret uh, Teixeira, uh, asking about so the link between policies. You mentioned uh, uh, the common agricultural policy uh, 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 on which also there is uh, quite a consolidated literature, but how about the recovery plan? How about new tools uh, that go over, over and, and, and above this? So, Luis, uh, if there are no further questions from the from the audience uh, here, like I'll leave the floor uh, to Luis for okay. like a, 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 a short discussion and then a quick, quick uh, comments by our uh, speakers uh, and discuss them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. I feel a little bit like Mission Impossible here, <laughs> trying to comment on, on the <laughs> so many topics. Um, let, let me pick up a few things that I think are, are, are really important. I mean, fully going to agree with Ian, the fact that public investment has collapsed is an immense challenge for additionality. Um, it has always been a challenge for us to measure additionality, has always been a challenge to enforce additionality, and this is a testament to that. And in a new programming period, we have even not proposed to measure it anymore. Um, so in a way, it's, um, you know, um, an acknowledgement of that difficulty. Um, the Mezzo Giorno, many people have mentioned it, um, and actually I'm going to be hopeful, <laughs> like Francesca. I think we can do a lot more, and the crisis has helped us to do a lot more. If I look at the RRF plan for Italy or Spain, I see a lot of potential to leapfrog into a much greener, much more digital, and much more transparent way of doing business and interacting with, uh, with governments and, and, and allowing firms and individuals to do so more easily. Um, when it comes to the, the tool, um, how we access these services, the question we ask is, have you interacted online? 
with public authority. So that's including through, you know, this little thing here. The question about computers, we've stopped asking because we reached 100% in so many regions, but I, we may want to indeed check how many people have access to, to, to a mobile phone. Um, following on the, want to say something, want to say something about uh, fuel poverty. We do have a social fund and it's a significant fund but what we really do with cohesion policies is we don't fund um, welfare payments. This is not something the EU does. It's be incredibly expensive if we tried. We fund investments. So it's very difficult for us to address fuel poverty by paying households. We can try and address fuel poverty by saying we're going to support investments in housing to make them more fuel efficient. We're already doing so a little bit, but maybe indeed we would need to do so more. But I think that logic, that distinction between not, uh, uh, you know, cohesion policy is not a welfare policy is an important one to remember. Looking at the comments on, 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 on green, um, in a way, what we're trying to do is really try and tell a positive story, because indeed, I think the story now is too much focused on costs, and we want to try and turn that uh, around and focus on the benefits. Um, and it's definitely better than the alternative of the 3% uh, increase in, in temperature, which is also something we've highlighted in the report. I would also agree that regions hit by a disaster really need a uh, quick access to funding to mitigate, you know, to respond to that disaster. And we do have a very small solidarity fund that tries and do that. But maybe, again, we need to scale that up to make sure that we people are aware that we will help them if uh, uh, such a calamity arrives, which unfortunately, the frequency is likely to go up. I, I really enjoyed Francesca's uh, comments, and I, I'm absolutely going to agree with her that we can do better. <laughs> we sprinkled the, the digital across. Um, I also like the idea of focusing on access, transparency, and democracy. We have touched it on upon here or there, but it's very you know, what we're trying to understand is also to try and get a subnational dimension. Some of these aspects really focus on, 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 on global issues or national issues. Um, but I would also agree with her that this crisis and the COVID pandemic in particular has really accelerated the use of online tools and digital tools and have shown us that we can do much more than we realized and much faster than we realized. And I'm hoping that the RRF as well as cohesion policy is gonna help us make that transition faster. Um, on the patents and open source, this is a perennial problem. The, the indicators we have on innovations like R&D and patents only capture a minority of important innovative activities. And I think that as time goes by, that, that share might even be shrinking. So we need to find new tools to understand where is innovation happening, including sources that don't require R&D or patenting, um, because it's important to make sure that everybody can participate. Um, having access definitely remains a challenge. Uh, some places still really have, have uh, slow connections, including mobile connections. Uh, it's not just uh, bro uh, fixed connections that we're looking at. Um, on firm heterogeneity, this is something we want to look more into. Uh, we're very much, you know, we can already see this national pattern that there's a lag in the terms of the use of these uh, different technologies and the, uh, and online uh, e-commerce e services, but we really wanna make sure that we understand why they're not using that. Um, we have a target of increasing that substantially, but if we don't understand why firms are not doing that, we can also not un know how we need to convince them that it's in their own interest to start using these tools. So there, there is more work to be done to understand what is, what is the obstacle there. And this will be a, a joint work. It won't only be cohesion policy that looks at that, but also uh, the colleagues and, and the DG Grow, which works a lot, particularly with, with the SMEs. On the short haul flights um, and rail, um, we didn't look into cost. 
even though cost is a massive obstacle. You know, why do people take Ryanair, not particularly pleasant airline? It's because it's cheap. It's not because people like, ooh, why aren't Ryanair flight, right? So what are we gonna do? Um, we need to do a couple of things. We're trying to already make it easier to buy a cross-border ticket already today. It's incredibly difficult. You don't have a one-stop shop. Uh, you know, you get different prices at different timetables at different locations. So we've created a, a, a regulation that requires requires all member states to create a single point where you can access all the public transport information. But that's just the, the information about the trips that are out there. The costs are still very difficult to reduce because basically every member state has their own national set of discounts and rules. And as soon as you cross a border, it becomes far more expensive than within a country. So I don't see any quick way of really making rail cheaper, but I would think it'd be correct if we uh, tax gasoline fuel, you know, airplane fuel at the same rate as we do uh, the fuel uh, or the energy used by trains, and that may help rebalance. I also, you know, we're trying to trying to get transport more fully in the emissions trading scheme, which should also rebalance the prices. I hope that if we get more demand for rail, this may help to reduce the prices, but it, it, is, a, it is a difficult aspect to really cover. Displacement. Um, displacement of firms is a trickier topic. Um, uh, it's really not something we try and encourage with cohesion policy but it might be an indirect effect. Um, but well, I've already talked way too long, so I'll stop there <laughs> and give the discussants an opportunity to say something as well. Thank you, thank you, Luis. So I would ask the discussant, we start uh, uh, with Ian. If you want to, fantastic, great. Mm -hmm. So a brief, a brief reaction. I'll try to be as telegraphic as possible. First, on, on the point on the, the the long tail of companies which don't do it. I think it suggests that instead of policies which focus predominantly on innovation and infrastructure, there should be some effort on diffusion, to find the ways in which diffusion of the new technologies can be brought in in a way which means they're far more endemic than they sometimes are. Cheaper flights, very quick point. Are we measuring cost correctly? As an economist, I bound to say the word externality. Planes have higher externalities than trains, and that's part of the problem. There isn't, isn't a way of capturing the cost of those externalities, the pollution they pump out, etc. And the third point I pick up is, which has been left hanging, is in, I think Miguel's question about who should do the make the difference. Ah, well, there is a, shall we say, a political answer, which is the principle of subsidiarity, place it where it ought to be, where it makes most sense. Mm -hmm. And then there's an academic kind of answer, which is all this theory of multi-level governance, trying to work out how you apply the principles of subsidiarity to decide where a policy should be enacted. So that's my three quick points. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Dane, please. Thank you. Yes, very quickly also on that question about who should do what. Um, the investments we have to make are really, really large, and some of them are in more frontier investments, let's say. They're the new technologies that we need to scale up, they're the regions that are harder to reach in terms of financing from private finance, from um, uh, public finance on the, on the national level. So there you need more local solutions, you need more um, to, to uh, delegate and, and uh, move the responsibility further down, but we also have the opportunities to scale up a lot of investments that are in areas where you already have some financing and some funding, but you need to do it at a much greater scale. And a lot of these do need to get tackled at the, at the national level. Some even at the regional level, we, we saw about the kind of train connections. And I'll, I'll come to that question as well, because I think it's a really good one about the cost and, and speed. Um, and Ian already mentioned the, the, the point that we are the price is just not the right price because we are not paying the cost of the, um, of the damage to the environment. If we invest more in high-speed rail, then uh, it becomes cheaper over time uh, because you have more availability, more competition. Um, so that is something that, that will come, but you also need to address it by uh, making the price of the, of the flights really reflect the costs that, that they face. And um, I think also what Luis was saying about the difficulties that are more practical, 
where do you book your trains? Is there a centralized service? I'll share very quickly a personal an anecdote on that. And a few years ago, um, which was before the pandemic, it was a very long time ago, but not that long time ago, I, I had to travel between Munich and, and Venice and there was an overnight train. So I thought, okay, I'll take the train instead of taking the flight. And uh, I live in the UK, so I booked my, uh, my train ticket on the uh, Italian train operator that was operating that, that train. I go to the Munich um, station and I ask, I give them my booking code and I ask them to give me the ticket. And they say, oh, but this is Deutsche Bahn. We cannot give you the ticket here. You have to get it from the automatic machine of Train Italia. Like, okay, great. Where is the automatic machine? They're like, oh, it's in Italy. <laughs> so so I have to, Italy to get my ticket out of the automatic machine, but I'm here and they just wouldn't get it. So some things to improve, um, but yeah, thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Dana. Francesca. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, yes, I mean, Francesca is reminding us that for people who are following us online, it's uh, later in, in large part of the rest of, uh, of, of, of Europe. Um, so let me like close the event unless there are like further questions or comments from the uh, people here. Uh, it has been a great pleasure to have the opportunity to listen to Luis uh, and all uh, our discussions today. Uh, in person and, and online. Uh, thank you very much for taking part. Uh, we are most grateful uh, to you all uh, that you could find the time in your busy schedule to be with us today. And we look forward to future opportunities to discuss uh, the digital and the green transitions and their consequences for regions. This is a long itinerary that our department has started last year with the first event on this topic. We had a large event in September, uh, a all day uh, workshop uh, in collaboration with the University of Roma Tre, uh, and we had this event today. So we look forward to other events that can contribute to foster a debate and a conversation on these uh, incredibly important and timely policy areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all.